Hello there everyone and welcome back to Tino, the last of Zivik, which you probably know it by now. Um, the world's best, and I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. Uh, we've got to talk about much too long. War, death, and chaos have become as much of a companion to Emma as Elizabeth have, she mused. It felt as if every time they're so gathered together to discuss local matters, things ever only ever got worse. She tried to keep up a positive attitude, it was all she could really do, frankly, but every time she learned of another cell of resistance fighters getting lit on fire and left to die, her view of the future dimmed ever so slightly. That day, she had found out that yet another nearby resistance village had been captured by the government. Oh, Bell had encouraged them to not be disheartened by the news. And yet, Emma was still sitting as rigid as a plank of wood in bed as Elizabeth softly cuddled her. How that woman managed to brush past the existential drill was a mystery to her. She shifted slightly, knees jabbing into her back. Emma sighed, trying desperately to settle down. What's the matter, love? Elizabeth asked. Emma almost wanted to scream if she'd woken her up. Don't worry about it, just go back to sleep. She probably could have felt the stare boring into her side. She shifted, moving into her lover's eye. Uh, do you think we're going to win this? It was a silence for a while before Elizabeth responded. Oh no, sweetheart, I don't know. Or it's guess we can run away. Do you want that? Emma wasn't sure. Could she truly leave her country behind after all she had done and try and save it? I don't know. Whatever it takes to keep you safe, I'll do it, she said, clutching Elizabeth tightly. I mean it. If I have to shoot Colin Jordan himself in the head, but then so be it. I'll always be there for you, Lizzie. Seemingly pacified, Elizabeth hummed gently and snugged, uh, snuggled even closer to her lover. They could sleep silent tonight no matter what the dudes in the government try. Love blooms on the battlefield and crunch. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Hey, Jack, you, you know, you ever see any of those rebels? Jordan was saying the wankers are freaks, solidify their positions here, and yet I haven't seen them one, single one of them. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I can't tell you why they're here, or why they aren't here, Eddie. For all we know, they heard our mighty boot shot and pooped themselves. The two laughed, covering up that heavy crunch, crunch, crunch. A left resistance member aimed his grenade for about 30 feet in front of the leading court, free corps officers. He was ready to throw it almost an hour ago since he learned of the entrance into the area. Several others aimed uh, their stolen mouths of rifles from the countless camp raids. Commander Oliver signaled out to auxiliary units to track down below. A smuggled of sterlings lined up against a tree line, tracked each pair of feet of sword for the triple dozen British free corps officers. They watched every head toss and turn from board, most likely wanting to strangle one of the left resistance members with their own hands. Colonel Tim turned his head up and gave the initiative. Pulling the pin and throwing the grenade, the commander ordered every member of the left resistance on the top of the hill to take cover. Crunch, 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 the bodies of Officer John and Edward got thrown at least three feet backwards as the explosion impacted the two men. The men right behind Jack and Edward would have to do both to avoid the body thrown to them, but also the several points of gunfire coming at them. The rest tried to hold their guard, but it ultimately failed. A little caution against uh, Colonel Tim, a handful of soldiers dropped down to hit the British Corps with their shovels, hopefully giving another purpose to their most of the time useless uh, item they had around. By the time they got down to the pathway, however, the Freak had all been shot. The costumes of the group spat on one of the corpses, a glorious victory. Back to work, ladies. Brenda could hardly remember the last time she had worked in a setting that wasn't her home. She had a blurry memories of having been asked to do a few hours in the factory making bombs and bolts when she was 18. It had been hard, but it made her feel like she was actually doing something to help her country, rather than sitting on her arse all day doing nothing. But then they lost the war and it was back home for Brenda until a man came to the doorstep of her house a few nights ago and said she was due to start her bit for the nation by working at a safe factory which was hollowed 20 years later. Um, she found herself next to a conveyor belt, pulling bullets and, together and assembling shells. The clothes she had been given were already covered in grease suit and all of the other unpleasant things that coated almost every surface in the factory. She was filthy sweating and had never been under such pressure to produce results as quickly before. And yet, Brando was loving every minute of it. Uh, the feeling of being useful while working both for a country and herself was liberating, and this could happen again after 20 years, and who was to say what could happen for other women in the next 20? We would prefer to keep them in the kitchen, but oh well. BSA quality checks. Because this one, we lose reliability by 10%. But this one, we get 10% more reliability. A key concern with the focus on quantity over quality is the risk of accidents that could occur. A common fear amongst many soldiers and amongst many of our leaders as well is that our newfound reforms in production could lead to accidents on the production line or even on the battlefield. Thus, ease such fears, we shall put the BSA on the case. We will hopefully be trusted with making sure we don't make rifles that are more dangerous to their users than their targets. So, I've uh, got some comments to go through as well. I'm not sure if we can actually defend the Isle of Man here. I don't think it's really possible, so. But overall, we're doing okay. We're doing alright. Um, I do want to get to here and cut all these guys off down here, but we'll have to see. We're doing pretty good in Wales right now. Um, I'm just waiting for this tank to make sure that they are strong enough to do whatever they need to. And we can try to go in. There we go. That you guys go right there too. Nice. Hold on for just a bit. So now Chester's gonna fall and we'll go to Liverpool. 
and then the oil depleting. It's no secret that Ger uh, I'm sure. Britain has been reliant on the Germans for oil for the past few decades. Now that the Reich and its oil fiefdoms have collapsed, we find ourselves in an especially dire straits in regards to fuel, and no short thanks to the Panthers rolling around the countryside. We take every possible measure to ensure that we have enough oil to weather the coming storm. That would be a difficult task, but a necessary one. Alas, the resistance catches with our trousers down. Also, we do have a cup of decaf coffee here because, you know, as normal, I, I, I would like to get to sleep tonight, probably. That'd be kind of nice. We can go to sleep sometimes. And... Hop out, maybe? Business as usual. Oh, he might give us another one. Would you have killed in the fascists and make me effing thirsty? A series. Nah, eh, there's nothing for me here. Oh, wait, real quick. Uh, a cheer is following the announcement with the young men gathered behind the counter, all raising their glasses and clinking them together. Teddy shot the man who'd spoken a thumbs up and began pouring an amber liquid behind the counter. She paled for this lot, not knowing that they could take, they could taste the difference. If there was one thing Teddy knew, it was that regardless of sight, young men just wanted to get drunk. Shutting off the pump with a flick of the switch, she slid the glass smoothly across the counter without spilling a drop. There you go, that hard fight, huh? Another one of the fighters shook his head. Eh, I traded about surrendered as soon as we showed up, huh? Hard fight happened a few days ago. By the front, chimed in from one of the fighters, helpfully. A different man that snorted. No oh, crap, it was by the front, Jack. Where else would the fighting be? The men descended into playful bickering, passing food back and forth. It reminded Teddy of last week too much for comfort when government troops had stopped in the village. He'd serve them too, pouring beers into waiting glasses and uh, bringing meals around. He could see several of them from the window go now, being marched around about in rifle point. A point uh, one raised his head, giving Teddy a more full look before being pushed onwards. Teddy shrugged. What did he expect him to do? As he turned back away from the window, the young fighter had given a beer nodded at him. You ought to join us, you know. There's more important things to be doing than working a pub. Not so long as uh, you allowed our drinking yourself into a stupor there, isn't? He said, eliciting laughter from the young man's friends. Like heck, he thought privately. Sounded like a lovely way to commit suicide, especially with government reinforcements on the way. Flushing his fake smile, he raised an empty pink glass. Now who wants another round? That's to make it easier to take them out. And we are there. Come on, you should be able to take these guys by now. I'm out. We are basically no field. God dang it. Well, that goes monarchy, I guess. You know? Good. I need you guys to go right here. Come on. There you go. An old night mirror born, huh? Well, they do they have a port here? They do, unfortunately. Hmm. It was just oh, Robert's luck that he seemed to have uh, uh, what were, in his opinion, the dumbest cows in England. It seemed to him that the battles of bullets flying in the distance would be enough to get any animal to move on from self-preservation. But clearly this cows were an exception to the rule. Move, Daisy hissed, giving the cow ahead of him a gesture to move with a stick. What, do you want to make friends with the bullet? I said move. The cow let a move protest in response, gazing at him with an uncomprehending dull eyes. He sat in frustration and resisted the urge to smack the stick into the ground. He could still hear the sounds of gunfire in a few field far below the hill he was on and took all the... He had to not simply run and leave the stubborn stupid cows to their fate, but he kept his farm through one war and darn if he was going to lose his livestock to another. Mustering the courage to look down, he saw a farmhouse under siege and the bodies of a number of government soldiers laying outside. A few could be seen in position behind barricades, but only a few. Him and in contrast were never to be seen, though judging by the sounds of the shots, he expected they were somewhere behind the rocks a few hundred meters before the farmhouse. Must be winning judging by the number of government bodies, he hoped that they did, honestly, that, that they stick to- wait. What was the roar? No, he thought to himself, not again, he couldn't bear to see it happen again. A panzer was rolling over the other hill, like a great steel beast. He came to the screams of panic from the rocks, muffled by the sounds of the panzer firing. After a while, it ceased, and there was no more screams. As for Robert, he continued to stare down into the field, all thoughts of cows forgotten. Instead, he thought of the man he saw die the same way 17 years ago. Scavenge all we can. It's not as if our only access to oil before the uprising was a singular continent spanning tap coming straight from Germania, with several individual barrels scattered across the country, coming from refineries, factories, and the like, in the coming struggle. It is vital that we secure each and every one of those barrels and drums. We cannot afford to leave a, even a drop in, of oil in the hands of the resistance. Oh, we've lost three. Good.
A black gold memorandum oil supplies ever since the defeat of Britain in the Second World War, Britain has almost been entirely dependent on the Reich for its oil supplies. Whilst this is a tolerable state of affairs for the previous few decades, it's no longer a viable solution given the chaotic nature of the Reich's political situation and the unrest domestically. Unfortunately, Britain is not currently positioned to re-establish any kind of trade internationally. This means that oil is rapidly becoming one of the most precious resources available for both sides of the uprising from both an economic and military perspective. Recommended course of action, ration any and all oil available, scavenge and loot resistance vehicles for it, come into your civilian equipment, and limit the amount of miles traveled by non-military per personnel per day. The situation will hopefully be resolved before a final complete fuel shortage. Memorandum concluded, save all we can. Uh, an official directive is to be sent to every regiment that we're currently feeling, that being able to avoid destroying enemy vehicles if possible. This may seem like a strange order, but one must remember that each vehicle is filled with precious oil that we can siphon out to fuel our own vehicles. Whilst avoiding the destruction of enemy vehicles may seem contradictory to modern warfare, is one of our only options given the circumstances. Nice. Well, we're getting there. We lost Isle of Man, but still. Boy, have coffee or something. And uh, someone says from the comments, uh, In general, the Civil War is supposed to be really difficult at this stage. The idea is you hold off for a bit, and then you went after the Resistance has exhausted themselves. Well, let's hope so. Good. Or the main. Uh, Hawkins stared out over the grey waters of the Irish Sea with the Glower. The defeat on man had been disappointing. The resistance's forces stormed the center of the island, cutting his men into an hour he was glowing on the ship fleeing to Bristol. His men had followed the well, though. They had done their best against all the odds, but a lack of resources and a bad strategic situation had been placed and had broken them. The evacuation of the southern pocket was a victory in no ways looking at him. The men on Hawkins had fought for the government on man. They'd fight for the government on the mainland. That was enough for a victory for him. So orders from London we've been reassigned to East Anglia front. His, his adjunct barked from behind him. The man... Brogue in his voice, reminding Hawkins of how he'd been recruited from the few civilians loyal to His Majesty's government as they withdrew. Well, very well, inform the man we're going back to war and tell them that London's proud of them. King Edward commands and we obey. Free Britain sees our evacuation from man as a natural occurrence. And since they are right, rumors uh, are they have already received the first created weapons from abroad, but not too much room still enough to cause trouble. It's just better for us. There's literally nothing we could do. I mean, that's impossible to hold. So, fire and brimstone. Ever since Kurt had joined the Luftwaffe, the thing he'd always loved the most about flying was how beautiful the world was at a distance. Far above in the clouds, all orders, drugs, and worldly concerns he usually dealt with melted away, leaving just behind a beautiful world of tiny trees and rivers below. The world below him was now, though, it didn't look beautiful at all. In fact, it looked like hell on earth. It's plain plastic over the husk of a forest, resembling a great, a gray pity, more than anything now. A few spindly trees, jutted up from the ground above the field of ash. Wherever Kurt looked, he could see craters left by where shells had struck in the ruins of a few lonely houses. He went for a moment to where uh, the people who had lived there had gone. They had they fled north, simply been burned to ash when his bombs fell, he probably never knew. He gripped the controls tightly. He had a duty, he reminded himself. A duty to his fatherland, to his Führer and his people. This war was about keeping Germans safe from both the Americans, Jewry, and their puppets. He had been too young to participate in the West Russian War, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that this was war. This was a cost of protecting the German people. There was just something disturbing about seeing it from above in a way he'd never had to before, after much more minutes of flying. The base finally came into view, much to Kurt's relief. As he brought the plane down, he found himself overwhelmed by a feeling of melancholy. He sat silently in the cockpit for nearly a minute, and would have had sat longer had the other men not come to check on him to ensure he hadn't passed out from the flight pressure. Tomorrow, the planes will fly again and unleash hell once more. Wolf's uh, reports are getting worse. Um, are our men wavering? We're dealing with the constant defections of those that are still here that are considering defection. Those that choose to stay are confused and scared, even our foreign soldiers wish to return to Germany. If we allow the situation to continue, London will follow the months. This cannot be allowed to continue. Well, says, I think you're about to lose man. Well, we did. That sucks. Um, but, honestly, we got Wales in, in the end, so it's a give and take. Someone says, why does using your reserves, your liquid reserves, pay, to pay down debt increase your spending? It sounds dumb. Don't ask me, man. So, someone says, even in death, he still has to fix the economy. That's right. Someone says, why do you not use a TNO soundtrack when, it, using the TN, when it's using the team's own made songs? I could probably get copyright struck, could I? Maybe not. I have no idea. 
Someone says, what the twist about Knight leading Himmler? I can't wait until it releases a resistance path for the burn rework. Oh yeah. Can't wait until it gets released. That sounds like fun to me. Because losses now are 55,000 versus almost 300,000, which is pretty good overall. Let them exhaust themselves on us. Sun in a blaze. Is Sun really a blaze? No, it's not really too much a blaze. Uh, the Prime Minister was horrified as he looked out the window. Flames covering the nearby skyline. Building after building, they would be practically unusable soon. Some people ran away from the chaos as others joined the riders in the quest to become walking flamethrowers, it seemed. Prime Minister Fountain asked, Do you mind telling me what's going on out there? Your pace is scaring me alone. Uh, now Kane gulped and answered with his vocal cords shaking, and you're afraid that the people of London are rioting. Fountain's heart skipped a beat. Well, crap, uh... One of the Prime Minister's assistants alerted Nal Kane, telling him that Visa and Maya is on the line. Sorry, let me take this call. Before Nal Kane could get a word in, Visa Maya began, Listen, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to have only to say this once, hopefully, and I'm going to make this quick. You see the riots outside your little house? They'll kill you. They'll kill all of us. They'll kill your family if you want to live. I hope you're able to realize that you need to authorize a garrison to move in. You decide not to, but I cannot guarantee what will happen to you. I don't want to hear a word from you until you've made your decision. Goodbye, Mr. Prime Minister. Nal Kane put the phone back into his holder and placed his hand against his forehead. His gaze, his eyes gazed straight through this desk and the countless papers on top. Sir, are you okay? Nal Kane woke up from his trance. Oh, yeah, sir, I'm doing all right, Andrew. I just got the news that I'm going to authorize the garrison to move in, which I'm going to have to do. No, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm afraid you shouldn't listen to that German sin in the black shirts. That's more organized than the German garrison could ever be. Their own country is currently facing a leadership crisis, which would obviously cause chaos in the military. Why would they be more helpful than Britain's very own men? I have to deny you that privilege. They have been here for years, and Visa Maya knows what he's doing, hopefully. When someone swears on your own life, it's hard to deny them. But you made an interesting point. I'll send them in. Hmm. I'm not sure which one to do. How can we not win here? I swear to God, doing this stuff, man. This some of this just does not make any sense. Why we're losing sometimes. A show of force? Well, let's get a rise in rations. Cases of desertion have been on the rise in the army, and one of the key reasons is the quality and availability of food. To combat desertion, we shall increase food production and ensure quality meals for every one of our brave soldiers. These meals will be shipped out immediately to the front line to ensure that each soldier is well fed and ready to fight on the full stomach. Like the old refrain says, a well fed soldier does not make you look over your shoulder. Dinner time, huh? Oh, good food was a luxury uh, in the British Army. Uh, Vic had gotten used to this over the past few months. You'd get a few packets of heart attack, desiccated meat that had probably gone off a few days before, and it was, if you were lucky, you'd receive some nice cold tea to go with it. That was the reality of life in the army, and he knew that going in. He longed for the man, mums, his mums roast pork every now and then, but that was simply nostalgia talking. He'd get plenty of it when they won. As he queued up however, he was met with a surreal sight. Lads were walking away from the line with non-state looking bread rolls in hand, alongside a box that looked to contain non-dried meat. As eyebrows shot up, Vic tapped the shoulder of Henry, the man in front of him. Are you seeing this? he asked. Yeah, it's new policy. We get better rations now, apparently. It's supposed to be a way of keeping up morale won't see me complaining, he said, flashing a cheeky grin. And moving up to get his rations, Vic was of two minds about it. Of course he wanted the nice food, but was he really going to be bought out by the simple idea of edible food after so long? It took about two seconds for him to solve his moral dilemma as his stomach growled at the flop. Food is food after all. Who was he to complain? The heart wants what the heart wants. And a promise of reward. In response to our enemy's numerical superiority, he was launched a publicly publicity campaign to get incentivized the public to sign up for the armed forces. A promise of burden that is not just secure from threats abroad and at home, but pledges to build a country ripe for change in a nation where all loyal men and women can build a family in. Although these incentives will show God and support from the general public for the crusade against these rebels. You going in now? Stasi defeated. Nice for them. A show of force. If we'd help survive, we need to provide our men hope that victory is even possible. That starts with Cornwall. It's a small peninsula, but even small victories can do wonders to bolster morale among the men fighting in the field. If we can't succeed here, then we have to do no chance to win the conflict anyway. Nothing left but to gallantly charge forth and achieve glory to inspire our own men. How do we lose here? You keep them in place. Then route, I command all of you to get back. We have to take action if you do not. I repeat. 
A band down a wearing rider approached a black officer, starting to wave his hands in front of the officer. What are you gonna do, huh? You're all a little being amused as puppets for the crowds across the sea. The officer slammed the butt of his mouth against the pavement. The rider shoved his face into the officers. Oh, I'm scared. Do it to arrest me, fascist little twerp. The officer hit him with his baton, arresting the man, threw him, threw him behind the rest of the black troops. Move forward, but remember, nobody dies. Guns remain on your back. A support filtered in the Downing Street. Andrew Fontaine's blood pressure grew. What the stupid crap are they doing? I told my leader down that this is the thing they cannot do. I told them all specifically that the guns do not leave their arms and go as hard as possible. Andrew, are people dying out there? Be some author in my lap if this happened, but look, no one's dying. Fontaine glared back at Nell Kane. BS. I still see new fires sparking as we speak, and I've gotten at least a half dozen reports from commanders on the ground that men have died. Now the king responded with a general distaste in his mouth. This matter is far out of my hands by this point. I do not want dead bodies outside my window. Fontaine shook his head irritably. This is outside your window, except I'm the one you made it put there. Issue of horse. Cornwall's here. Cornwall's fallen, a small victory, but one we can surely bolster this with safe propaganda. Let us take pictures of our victory, those allowed aboard the corpses of corpse. We will distribute those pictures and leaflets and newspapers across the country. The resistance will falter while the loyals will gain, regain faith in a cause, and let all know this is only the beginning. We shall be victorious. How much more do we have to go? Oh my god. No, they, get this. they really want to continue attacking us, I'm telling you that, but through a lens. Alright, gentlemen, a little left. You in the middle, you, uh, your knees a bit further up, that's right. The soldier nodded at Arnold, moving his knee further upwards. Arnold the pop discarded enemy weapons. Arnold grinned. There we go, perfect. Now hold still. Flash. Working as a professional photographer in Britain was essentially the same thing as being a full time propagandist. This is a well known fact, it was not becoming. Was not something many would be keen to debate. Weddings and family photographs were such a constant steady stream of small work, but the real money lay in doing photo shots like these on behalf of the government. Noble troops staying triumphant over the broken remnants of the enemy. That sort of thing. Arnold found it was rather twee. And honestly, but money was money. Alright now, gentlemen, if we could have one of you all crouching down next to them for this one. The men nodded, moving to a group. As they did so, however, Arnold caught a glimpse of what was behind the soldiers, and he had to suppress a goal. Broken bodies being pulled out of sight, he knew that this was a battlefield. What kind of idiot would him? But this was the closest Arnold had ever been to the action. For a moment, he wondered who these men were being dragged away to be thrown into a pit where when they lived. Then the simple thing re-entered his mind, and all it was, well, again, money is money. Lash, the Free Corps question. Ah, the BFC, the oldest and potentially largest legacy of our German friends, the British Free Corps. Led by Thomas Holly Cooper, the largest quasi-paramilitary group in the country and under the supervision of the German police, and more importantly, the SS, in the wake of the Civil War. They have risen quickly in prominence as one of the key loyalist forces. In response to this, we must finalize their policy and core. I have a serious discussion whether to give this organization more support in the battle against the rebels. On the one hand, they are a group of extremists possessing a mob-like mentality and led by an utter lunatic. In addition, we should keep in mind that embodying a paramilitary group with no government oversight, their only answers to Germanic could have unforeseen consequences if they got out of control. On the other hand, the amount of manpower and arms the organization has could give us the upper hand in the war. Our choice is ours, the consequences ours to face. I mean, don't get me wrong, guns would be nice. A little bit more fuel, which would be nice, actually. Come on, get in there, boys. It's taking you so bloody long. Jordan's murders. You must be mad, Butler yelled, uncharacteristically agitated. The war dragged on for far too long, and in haste, Nell Kane had called an emergency cabinet meeting. Manpower was running low, and thus a decision had been made in regards to the role the BFC could play in the war. Naturally, Butler was a little enthusiastic about him. 
The lunatics, mad dogs would kill more on our side than they will the resistance. There won't be a burden to govern by the time they're through with it, he ranted, pacing around the room. Several other ministers not in tandem. The British record is certainly not a popular bunch, even among the fascists. As if on cue, Fontaine spoke up. Then we chain them, spread the members out thinly. Only allow one BSC regiment in for every five non-BSC regiments. Jordan will only ever acquiesce if we give him more guns, so we may as well get him out of the way. Butler was incensed, gapping, a gopping at Fontaine. So you give them the tools they need to drain terror on people too, then, huh? He scoffed, leering at Butler. <clears throat> No, we throw them at the most well-defended areas. That way it's a minimal loss of value on our end. The two men continued to argue back and forth whilst Noel Kane sank into his thoughts. Nobody liked the BFC, but times were desperate. The generals had been up and so subtly pressuring him to give Jordan what they wanted for ages. Could it truly afford an Atu? Sighing, Noel Kane made his decision. We won't work with the frothing lunatics. Jordan can get stuffed. <coughs> our avowed extremists are placatable rivals. Our vital soldiers. Mm hmm. Our replicable rivals. Despite our reservations and the fears of defeat and struggling in the cabinet, uh, we cannot support Hollow Cooper and his band of murderers. We cannot, in good faith, give the BSC more power than they already have and evolve beyond a paramilitary force. While we cannot erode their power entirely in fears of angering the Reich, we have decided for the good of the country to diminish their power, granting them say over occupied territory. Jordan is unstable, radical even, by the SS's standards, and even a present threat to our rule. Heaven knows that what could happen if we grant the fool more power. We must instead look elsewhere for support, and in time, hopefully, the BFC shall be made irrelevant. Perhaps with that, Britain, once the fighting is over, can return to some peace after two long decades. Get y'all's tushes over there. I mean, we're slowly winning, don't get me wrong. And the political power is nice, but there's nothing I can really do with it. You know? We've actually almost made it up here, too. I wonder if you could come out here and take two of the guys here. Could you? Maybe. Now we can stick all like six divisions here, which would be fantastic. Ah, wow, look at that. Now they're attacking us even more, which I want. Our avowed extremists. Wolf's reports are getting worse. When are they not getting worse, my friends? Crap. Wolf's consistent reports that come in from the German to garrison have been gradually getting worse and worse. They illustrate the dire state of the garrison's fuel situation. Tanks running off of fumes, nearby cars being appropriate for fuel. Supply universally running low was not pretty. Something's got need to be done without, about this right now if we want to uh, chan have a chance of winning. Oh. You guys holding out here. That's all we're doing. Having a good old time. Holding out. Nice. Good. Well, kind of despots looking better. Which way do we want to go now? Panzer shall halt. Stability. I do like getting free fuel though. But I like to improve military professionalism. Redefining combat. Did the Arthur Arthurian knights of old ta need tanks or motor cars? No, they bravely changed into battle on horseback, laying waste to their foes and what of the light brigade, charging selflessly into an enemy firing line in a seemingly hopeless situation. These men are all paragons of the British fighting spirit, and in times and cost must we have may have to call upon them that spirit again, reintroducing cavalry and foot soldiers into the army. For king and country, my friends, of course. We what do we do no less? Mm, I wanna go here, 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 here. That's what we're gonna exactly here. that radar station is going to be very valuable to acquire. Good. Up at the end, huh? Good. We're finding combat. 
We all never failed them. A lesson here can be taken from our German friends. When they invaded the Soviet Union, that bastard hive of Bolshevism and treachery always said that they couldn't not win. Oil froze in their panzers and their bullets jammed in their guns, and yet using the same tactics that we are now beginning to employ, they won and became the greatest power on the continent. You must always remember that the old ways are not always the worst ways. And now we've linked up here too. Look at this. Beautiful. Go in a system. Cool. And what do it say us now? The insurmountable odds of the Teutonic Knife face as they slew the Bolshevik dragon back in the 40s is similar to the situation we find ourselves in now. We stand as Britain's sword and shield against the rats and the resistance, and we all win against them. Whatever we win, with horse and sword, whether we do it or sword, with horse and sword, or gun and truck, it does not matter. After all, it's not like any American tanks are rolling in to make our lives miserable yet, is it? Or are there? Nope. Kill them off. Nice. And would you look at that? Good show again. The Wrath of God. Rob had never actually seen a tank in battle. He never actually had any reason to, after all. The perfectly average son of a local green grocer, he didn't expect to be drafted into the army. It was a nice idea, though, he supposed. King and country and all that, and the other lads were all right once you guys know them. One aspect of life in the armed force with that he would not expect it was the mighty panzer. The first time we saw one was an engagement with the resistance in Birmingham. It reminded him of the scriptures that his father would read to him. Great hope. Hawking metal monsters that shoot blasts of fire down upon the unworthy. It was all inspiring, really. The way it reduced those men and men who were just like him, he supposed, although he didn't like to do all that, to a pile of charred rubble, it was shocking. And yet, when he saw these nine invincible behemoths trying to buy, he couldn't help but wonder how the heck were they able to keep it going. What could keep firing it going like that? Was it plentiful? And if what was, then why weren't they? Weren't there more? Modern technology, huh? At long last, winter's passed. This year's winter had been long and grueling for both sides of the Civil War. Our army has been under constant pressure from the lack of supplies, lack of manpower, and even the ever-present assault from the rebel forces. Cases of equipment freezing and frostbite have only been common in our tanks. We can only assume and hope that this problem has been rampant on the enemy side as well, yet we survived, despite our enemy's many advantages. Our government has withstood the test of the past few months and remains to stand, and proves been not broken. Now the winter has uh, a pass and spring is rapidly approaching, we'll make new strategies to combat the enemy and recapture lost land, onwards to a better and secure vic future, onwards to victory. The time for consolidation is over, and now commences the time for reclamation. Oh, so getting all this would be very good. You're going to instantly start assaulting this place, though. Getting those last eight divisions encircled and destroyed would be the best thing in the way to do a generic assault. Happy July, everybody. Still kind of cold, I guess, huh? Don't let it move. They lost over half a million soldiers, and it's still not enough for them to capitulate. Like, my god. Who's gonna win? The, oh, I guess. I guess Speer won. On Spider. Good job, Speer, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, the GGR. Let's get everybody on the line for three, two. Go ahead. Glasgow, huh? Storm is past. Gentlemen, just last our last year our fair hours were on the brink of collapse and ruin now. Just one wrong decision could have seen a plunge into a long and dark night of Bolshevism and the generosity, now the Kane said, addressing a room that it looks substantially happier. And more confident than happened a few months ago, but we stood firm, our soldiers stood firm, and our allies stood firm. We've lasted through the winter and now poised to reclaim our land from the darkness that seeks to destroy it. The time has come to strike back. But after its applause, sounded from the cabinet, assembled generals of the Nell Kane finished his speech, a smile forming on the PM's face as he looked at the portrait of his mentor and predecessor, Barry Donville. 
gazing down on the meeting from above. They would love to see this. As the applause subsided, General Wolf and Templar stood to address the ministers. Wolf Wolf began with a pleasing report on the status of the garrison and British forces, both having endured the winter, well and ready to launch counteroffensives on all fronts. Templar spoke next on the status of Himmler and their forces, whilst they were in far better shape than they had hoped. Himmler had nonetheless been hit hard by the winter and were now firmly on the defensive. The tides of war are shifting in our favor, General Wolf, and I recommend we launch concentrated assaults on key strategic regions held by Himmler. We do that, and we will crash this uprising once and for all, he concluded, with nods of agreement from the general staff and another round of applause from the ministers. Thank you, gentlemen. I shall leave. The matters of reconquest in the most capable hands. It is now time to show that Britain, that we are united as never before. Uh, the party, the military, and allies united to defeat treason and save our people. We shall triumph once again. The long winter is over. The spring of conquest begins. One over the over the wire one last time. The harsh winter has brought the pillars of our knee, state to its knees. Has finally ended, and it dawns as a new sun arises. This is a sun of war, a sun of victory, and we have drawn upon drawn upon our plans to drive the traitorous scum from the shores of Albion, and we will do so. Our men are ready, from the hardened veterans of the British Free Corps to our valiant German allies. The final struggle for Albion is about to begin. For king and country, we shall emerge victorious, of course, in which we basically already have. Uh, if you do this, you do not look the move at all. Number one, the government prevails in Britain. After months of bloody fighting, the British government has unexpectedly regained control of the Isles. As the collaborator regime was widely seen as being caught off guard and woefully underprepared, a victory for the government seemed to be untenable. However, after surviving a harsh winter and countless lives being spent, order has been restored, with the head of the resistance, Maxwell Knight, being scheduled for execution alongside most of the prominent leadership of the uprising. Prime Minister Ronald Nell Canis hailed the government's victory as being a triumph for order and justice. The German military presence expected to assert itself on the Isles in the coming weeks, alongside a brief period of heavy reconstruction. Along with the end of the uprising, however, Nile Kane is expected to step down as Prime Minister, who will overtake his place as unknown. Burden is chained once more, and orders prevail. Look at that. Chaos will not be able to go further than 6%. Uh, though beset on all sides, abandoned by those we trust and outnumbered 2 to 1, we have emerged victorious from this dreadful crisis. Burden lays scarred, cities in partial rumble. Uh, rumble. It's countryside scorched and its people in misery, yet we've survived. With this victory comes order. With order comes peace. It'll be a long time before we fully recover from this tragedy, but we can rest easy knowing that the right people have emerged victorious. God save the king! Oh, we're back to the chaos. Crap. Well, let's get a lot of political power now. That's good. Fractured food supply. Every society is three meals away from chaos is an old adage that we would do well to remember in these trying times. Following the most almost universal disruption of supply lines in the uprising, we are left with a nation that teeters on the precipice of famine. We must work diligently to restore our supply chains and ensure that people do not starve, lest we risk once more plunging ourselves in anarchy. Routing the rats. Although the war is over and the head of the traitorous resistance have been killed or captured, unrest still plagues the land. Some disorganized but dangerous cells of the former resistance movement still hold out, foolishly believing that they can somehow stand victorious. They continue to launch raids and fight against the brave soldiers attempting to restore order to the sacred land. We need to end this order fast. Let us redouble our efforts to mop up any signs of resistance remaining. We were far too leading 20 years ago and almost cost Britain everything. We can shall not make the same mistake again. The Fall of Angels. When Philby handed him a report about a confirming the surrender of the last known Himmler holdout, now Cain felt his body tighten, or lighten, actually, from his burdens. Night was done for, and Jones and McLean were soon to join him. The half of the resistance was dead or captured. The rest had scattered, broken so badly that the thought of another uprising in the next three decades was now a blissful impossibility. England has prevailed. Now Kane handed the report back to Philby. Thank Christ they're done, he said. An impromptu celebration started on, in number 10. Civil servants broke out branding and special advisors laughed alongside military officers. Now Kane gave a speech praising the loyal sons and daughters of England for putting down the rabble. He noted that there were some staff who kept their heads down into the work during the party, and a few were outright absent. Citing illness, they had gone home early. Now Kane made sure that Philby recorded their names. A celebration continued. Now Kane felt weighted down by the fatigue. He excused himself and sat down on the terrace. He felt his age. He felt it more than most men is sending in the Sand in the joints, lead in the bones. Had the uprising taken that much out of him? Perhaps in earlier time it was not such a bad idea. From Noidar, he could relax in his final years with his legacy solidified. He'd be the man who kept England together and he would not need to suffer leading its rebuilding. A burst of nervous energy should have nail Kane's body. No, he would not be allowed to get away with that quickly. There would be a successor, but he needed he would need to keep his country from collapsing until then. He, like England, needed a soldier on, but not just yet. Now Kane rose up from his seat, ready to rejoin the party. They'd won only minutes ago, and there were plenty of time to celebrate. Malkane stepped back inside number 10, setting aside the waste for tonight. 
The rest of the king, the mighty lord, cast proud fiend from his seat, cleaning, clearing the air. Well, now all the horrible business is behind us, it's high time that we make, take a moment to breathe. And during that moment, we need to reflect upon exactly why is that we were plunged into the civil war, aimingly out of nowhere. And why did this happen, and who's to blame, and what can be done? The answer is simple. A mole further resistance had betrayed a trust and weaseled his way into the very echelons of the government, and none of us thought the wiser. Now as a snake, we have no way of knowing if he was just one of many in the pit. We cannot risk falling into the trap again. A thorough review of everyone within government will be conducted, and if all else fails, we will talk to the arch traitor himself tonight. Jerusalem despoiled. When Gerard Wallop had stood atop the west cliff of Whitby with his colleagues in the English mystery thirty years ago, William Sanderson had proudly remarked that the town of it was all English should be. As he stood there, Again, but alone for those bodyguards, he wondered what their founder would think if he were he was still allowed to see it now. Its streets, once busy and full of laughter, had nearly no people walking them now. Buildings lay in disrepair with collapsed roofs and holes visible even from his, his high vantage point. The Earl was no stranger to devastation. The horrors he had witnessed in the fields of Verdun and Neuve Chapelle would remain with him forever. To see it inflicted on England's green beauty, though, disturbed him more than he could say. That's why he fight, he reminded himself. He cannot simply sit by and watch as the Jew and socialist torn nations apart to the very soul time and time again as the times. The struggle seemed futile, yet it was a struggle worth fighting. Sir, what shall, shall I inform the mayor you'll be delayed? Asked a bodyguard. Wallop waved a hand dismissively. No need. Boy, by the car for now. The bodyguard nodded, leaving him to his thoughts on the barren view. Not entirely barren, though, mused Wallop. Far down below, but near the docks, a few fishermen were still preparing their boats, landing, uh, loading rods, f fuel drums, and satchels. Well, come I, what may, men of English character gathered up their tools and got to work, and now the pair had to tip their hand too early with uprising. England's people would be free, too. All they would need was a stern guiding hand in Downing Street when his colleagues had suggested that thought thirty years ago he snorted bitterly, dismissing it as an impossibility. But now, now it was ne nearly within his grasp, all needed was to reach out and take it. He returned back to his town, making his way to the car. Let us be off. I've seen what I needed to be seen. A last hurrah. The roar of engines filled the streets just outside the pub as columns of soldiers moved through the city, rolling with little resistance. Roy Kemp gripped his pistol tightly, his heart racing as he sat in the warm brick basement with the pub, surrounded by his compatriots, his friends, many had fought with for so long who had seen all others fall in the struggle for freedom. They fought through sweat and tears and shed blood for the rights of the worker and the common man against the fascist pigs who bowed down to the overlords in Berlin. Now it all seemed pointless. What the heck do we do now? Roy asked those nearest to him, all standing around a large table as some dust fell from the ceiling when another large truck rolled past. Everyone's on the run. We're out of hideouts. We're out of bases to work from. We've got no places to go. We're just dead, is what we are. If I'm dead, I'll take as many of those bootlickers with me as I can, Anderson. A stop fellow who had spent most of the war as an artillery man loaded up his own pistol. He looked at the others, who is also with me. Most of the others not in agreement, grumbling about killing as many of the Nazis as they had bullets. Roy wondered if they felt the pounding of their hearts in their chests, like he did in his. As he read his own pistol, me too, he said. He may have been terrified of death, but he wouldn't be caught dead as a coward. Let's move the tables into defensive positions, place the chains here, here, chairs here, 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 and here, I think. Roy began pointing, and soon the group of rebels were setting up barricades for cover when the government forces eventually came rushing in. Just as they finished putting the last table into place, the door upstairs was thrown off its hinges as one of the boots of the fascist dog slammed into the wood and broke it. Soldier after soldier, armed with a rifle, stormed into the basement. The rebels were ready, firing shots into any who came too far down the stairs. The bodies piled up on the last steps, but so did two the behind the barracks. Roy only had a few more minutes of the last left of his life, but he'd go down as he had lived. The rebel resistance was snuffed out, street by street. Into the fields. Let's face it, even before the Civil War, we were barely producing enough food to feed ourselves, and following the devastation that war has brought upon us, we are starting to have to make many tough decisions in regards to how we'll feed our people. Now, uh, that many farmers had had their crops crushed by tank treads, we find ourselves dangerously close to national starvation. This cannot be allowed to happen. It would be a humanitarian disaster, and we'll send men into the fields, and by God, we will not let our people starve. Friends in high places. Let's face it, no matter how much one may love or love the German conglomerates, they've made themselves an indispensable part of the British economy. And when one looks at the war torn remnants of Britain, the need for their assistance is undeniable. Not only will the public continue to reap the benefits of the high quality products, their return presence will create the jobs we so desperately need to bring the economy back from the brink, of course. We don't condemn this, but we have precious little choice in the matter. We must simply continue to hold our noses to it and carry on. Ah, uh, final net alive. Um, not a sound could be heard in the rebel encampment. Uh, sends the fright. A faint crackling of the fire. It was struggling to stay alight, given the dampness of the wood it was built upon. Emma and Elizabeth kept their vigil over Old Bill, who had been caught by a stray gunshot. He tried to insist that they had left him, they leave him behind, but they weren't about to let that happen. After they lost Major and Harry last week, they're still shrank by the day. It was just them, Bill, and the Bobby and Tom now left. The collaborators had pushed back all the way into the woods, but they kept fighting. It wasn't as if there was much else to do. Do you think they followed us here? Emma asked. Nobody in particular. We weren't as quick as usual. They could have been lying in wait. We have no way of knowing. Elizabeth said, said, squeezing her hand. But I certainly hope not. Emma looked over her, at her partner, seeing tears rolling gently onto her cheeks. She said nothing, only squeezing her hand back, silently comforting her. They both knew exactly what they were all terrified of most and how fa f real that fear was. Suddenly, the gunshot in the distance broke into silence. Elizabeth's head whipped in that direction. Crap, she whispered, letting go of Emma's hand and running up from the distance, in the darkness. 
Emma's eyes widened before she ran after her partner. As they ran, she silently prayed that everything would end well. Serpents in the garden. <clears throat> I don't blame you in the least for being shook about the whole situation, Kane said idly to swirl around his drink. Not one of us could have seen what Maxwell really was. Yet all of us fooled across the table. Kim Philby nodded wordlessly in agreement, staring blankly across the bar. The other patrons of the bar milled around aimlessly, seemingly unaware that two of Britain's most important leaders were in the midst. Then again, with how bedraggled and even thought Philby looked, Kane could only assume that they simply did not suspect him. In a way, he felt for Philby the most out of everyone whose lives had been torn apart by the uprising. Him and Knight had been close as one would expect two senior members of MI5 to be. Knight's betrayal had left him hurting deeply. What we needed was to be more thorough. That's the long and short of it, Philby said before knocking back in his glass of whiskey. A steely determination glimmered in his eyes. I'll be darned if I let anyone like Knight ever get that high up in MI5 again. Ron, I can promise you that. Kane nodded at the man understandingly. He had made a good choice in picking Philby as a new head of Britain's intelligence. To a Britain free of traitors, Kane said, raising his glass to the small smile formed on Philby's face. That steely determination giving way to a hint of slyness, as if he knew something that Prime Minister didn't. To Britain free of traitors indeed, and from the shadows. A twig snapped uh, beneath Ben's boot as he, he and his squad crept through the forest. It was almost pitch black, and the freshly fallen rain left the ground muddy and wet. They had been sent there to try and root out a group of resistance fighters who had been sighted coming in and out of the woods for the past week. He wasn't too familiar with these three men. Adolf and the rest of his usual comrades had been sent to the city, where they had been doing much of the same, only in an urban environment. Ben could have used a break from the inner city for a while, he supposed. Seventeen years there does that to a man. Seeing a faint plume of smoke in the distance, Ben held up his hand, gesturing for the man to stop. All right, he whispered. Looks like we found him now. Before he could speak, a bullet went through his head, uh, went through the head of a man at the back. His blood sprang over the two in the front of him. Chaos erupted as the two men from the resistance burst from the trees, each firing indiscriminately as the other two men. Uh, ben moved, moved to try and dodge out of the way. Before he could, he felt cold steel press against his neck as a strong slender arm grabbed his torso. He struggled desperately trying to keep his neck away from the knife. He reached for the gun holster to his waist and pulled the trigger, firing twice behind him. Whoever was holding him to the floor uh, fell to the floor, choking. He turned around, seeing that it had been a blonde woman dressed in a camouflage clothes. A stream came from further in the forest. Ben looked up, seeing that it came from a dark-haired woman further in the whole woods. Ben's life flashed before his eyes. All the other men were dead, and the other resistance fighters were bound to be closing in. He ran, trying to not let the image of the man's blown open head and the blonde woman's face haunt him. Where did they come from? Asking or begging? Normally, when meeting the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and one of his most important cabinet me members, the procedure was that you would show up promptly, smile, and shake their hands, and sit down and discuss whatever business you had with them in a respectful and courteous manner. The corporate titans of Germany, however, did not seem to believe these rules apply to them. Prime Minister, sorry for the delay. We had important business with our Eastern operations, said him and Josef Abs. The only the Verwirtschaftsführer Ver 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 is present, leading a pack of executives from IG Farben, Dalen Benz, Siemens, and Reichswerke into the room 20 minutes after the meeting was meant to have started. Knowing he had no choice, Nell Kane simply smiled and welcomed them. The meeting continued for several hours, with Butler's economic projections uh, and smooth presentations prompting rounds of polite applause and silent approval from the German executives, slowly swaying them towards reinvesting in Britain. Just as the initial contracts and offers were being laid out on the table, however, Ob silent, the entire meeting struck. Just a moment, please, gentlemen. Now, I'm not trying to be annoying here. Your presentation was brilliant, Mr. Butler. And Britain does look like a great place to invest. He paused for a moment, flashing a wolfish grin at Nalkane, but I have one rather major concern that's stopping me from agreeing to all this. Will a previous privileged space in your market continue? If not, as well, then... There it was, the previous privileged space. That meant total mega-corporate uh, dominance in the British economy. That's what this whole charade had been all about all along. The executive's previous nods and words of approval meant nothing compared to the word of OBS, and everyone waited on what Nalkane would say next, even though they all knew what it would be. Of course, they're OBS, you have my word. Why is spending so high? Civilian so is very high. Hey, we destroyed the poverty rate. We got better. Just have a civil war. That's all. Um, feline uh, diplomacy. Now, uh, Ronald Nall Kane's meeting with the German ambassador was meant to confirm, with full certainty, his government's triumph over the rebels. The afternoon proceeded as he expected. They each gave a speech affirming their commitment to good governance of Britain and cooperation with the Einheit's Pact. And they had afternoon tea in front of cameras. Diplomatic guests were exchanged. Polite conversations were held. We have one more uh, gift for you," said the German ambassador. And their attention was turned to the cloth draped box. Fourth. Brought forth by one of his ambassador's assistants. Lacking a magician's flourish, the ambassador merely pulled the cloth out of the way and revealed a pet carrier. Emerging into the light was a little creature, white coated and blue eyed, with wide ears and small, straight whiskers. She's a German Rex, recited the ambassador with little intonation as his gift blinked. Nal Kane looked at the ambassador, then at his staff who lay beyond the crowd, and then at the cat. A product of Aryan breeding born only a few days ago, we give this gift to the English people as a symbol of the new life out of the struggles of war. Well, it's what a lovely gift, Mr. Ambassador. He scooped the kitten up into his arms and seemed to be too bewildered to scratch her way up. You know, we've been looking for a new chief mouser. He gave the little kitten a little scratch on the head, some of the civil servants in the crowd deflated. The Rex's generosity precluded their own pets from being selected. The German ambassador had a vague idea of what a chief mouser was and did not care to know more. 
The cat looked up at him with those big eyes, and Elkian was struck with the question, What's a namer? An answer soon followed, one that would hopelessly call to mind a simpler, stronger time. A name that would tell everyone that everything was fine, just like it was before. Say hello to little Peta. Britain? Nowhere to run. McLean shivered. Hunched in a circle with some remaining members of the SOE, the last of the freedom fighters of Britain. Like Boudicca and the Celts before him, they had been beaten against the superior force of empire and totalitarianism. Uh, bullets rained into the walls of the nearly collapsed church they were hiding within, his roof partly caved in so they could easily see the flashes of the artillery slamming into the dirt around him. By some miracle, the flashes had yet to hit the church. But by the time the crack of dawn would begin to spread across the horizon, the church would be in their sights and they'd all be blown to pieces. He looked to those who had survived him during the war admirably, the true heroes of Albion. We cannot let their sacrifice go to waste. You almost almost begin to get to your boats by the shore. Given the darkness, they likely haven't spotted them yet, but by dawn we'll have no escape. I'll stay here to keep their fire. But sir, you're more important than all of us. You're our commander. You can't sacrifice yourself. There must be another way. One of the younger soldiers, barely 17, spoke up. Despite this and other protests, McLean brushed him off. He stood firm in his convictions and went to take a rifle and relieve one of the soldiers guarding the door of the church. Go when I gave you an order, man. Get to it. His commands quelled a dissent rising from the, among the group. The finality of his orders cleared and the protests turned to murmurs. And then they began to pack up. Taking all essentials with them, they took whatever they could carry on their backs and bid farewell to the commander. McLean managed to hold off the fascists for an entire hour. It was more than enough time to give his men the head start they needed. They may as well have been at the shore already by the time the fascists were at the gates of the church. McLean knew that he had minutes of his life left if he were to continue fighting. The fight was now over. He tossed his rifle aside and waited for the government forces to stop their own fires. They wondered if they had finally gotten him. Then he turned his head towards the doorway and shouted, I surrender. It's the end. Time seemed to slow down as the bullet passed through Elizabeth. Uh, the way her body quickly tensed and then crumpled to the ground would be seared into Emma's eyelids as long as she lived. She screamed, the boy who had shot her gopped at her, but running away like a coward like his Bobby and Tom chased him away. She ran over to Elizabeth, cradling her gently. She was still breathing, but it was labored. Her usually rosy cheeks had faded to a white as the blood dripping from the wound darkened the camouflage jacket. Lizzie, she asked. Elizabeth looked up at her, smiling and stroking her cheek. Hey there, gorgeous, it's me. It's Emma. You're going to be okay, all right? Just let's, let's get you up, she said, trying to lift her up. Suddenly, Elizabeth's arm fell to the ground, her chest stopped moving. Emma started to stop. No, 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 Lizzie. Lizzie, she said, shaking her lover's body. Warm, salty tears began to pull around her eyelids. Lizzie. Elizabeth said nothing. Her glassy eyes uh, stared up into the night sky, that same smile etched onto her face in death. The tears were unstoppable. She lowered her face into Elizabeth's chest, sobbing heavily. She forgot entirely about the possibility of the other soldiers being nearby as she wailed for the loss of her entire world. Emma came a gruff voice from behind her. She did not look up, but the moment she knew it was old Bill. Nothing else mattered at the moment. Emma, he repeated, shaking her. He finally looked up, seeing him hobbling along. We have to go. If they find us here, they'll be back. Emma shook her head, sniffing. No, I can't. I just, I can't leave her here. Old Bill put his head on his hand on her shoulder. Emma, she would want you to carry on. Keep fighting, please, Emma, he said. As own eyes began to water, I can't lose anyone else. Looking into the old man's eyes, she nodded, before, but before leaving, she closed Elizabeth's eyes, kissed her on the forehead. I'll never forget you, Lizzie, never. Sailing trawlers. Ever since Britain first sent her many ships out onto the wide open seas, fishing had been a staple of our economy. It was a time honored tradition for a man to set out with nothing but a net boat and his own grit and determination, and frankly, we need more men like that. There's no secret that our inland food supplies are dwindling faster than we can replenish them, so we must use all of the available avenues to their full extent. Fishermen will receive greater pay in the government show subsidizing boats, which will hopefully get more men out of the on the waves. If the land cannot provide for us, then we must look out to the sea instead. Ooh. Rationing measures. Our supply of food is getting low, arguably worse than it was during the Second World War. Rationing is a system that proven to work effectively, even under an international blockade. Therefore, in order to combat this current situation, we'll dust off the old plans for rationing food and fuel and begin issuing ration books to our citizens, but unfortunately, we have to end the episode there. If you enjoyed it, and we finally finished this war, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll also see what else we can do with Britain, or I guess the United Kingdom. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.